Chapter one. I've come to our family vacation home, the north end of Lake George in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. It's 2010, late November. Tourists have long since gone. I've come alone for 10 days of solitude to read, to write, and reflect. I have a very understanding wife named Phyllis. <laughs> like most mornings, I've hiked the mountain behind the house just before sunrise. And as I now sit on a ledge overlooking the lake, watching the sun come up over the mountains on the eastern shore, I am filled with an incredible sense of awe and gratitude for being here. By here, I suppose I mean this particular spot on this particular day. But in a larger context, I realize that gratitude is the overwhelming and predominant sensation in my life. It seems like I stop dozens of times a day, every day, no matter where I am, to give thanks just for the simple privilege of being alive. I haven't always felt that way. For much of my life, I realize I've been a selfish little nerd, complaining, moaning, whining, because the world will not adjust itself to my particular whims or desires or supposed needs. The sun comes out from behind a cloud and shimmers on the water, and I smile as I contemplate the strange irony of events some six years earlier that have led to this incredible sense of gratitude. Chapter two. I'm sitting in a hematologist's office at the Mayo Clinic. It's September 2004. I'm there as a result of some rather strange blood test results back in Columbus. I've had two days of testing. They can seem to find nothing wrong. I'm getting ready to pack up and leave the doctor's office, and just like in the movie, the phone rings. Doctor picks up the phone, jots down a few things, writes down a few things, and then turns to me ever so slowly and says, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have blood cancer. You have a slow developing but incurable form of blood cancer. That's when I ask the question, the question that has to be on anybody's mind at that particular point in time, but a question you really, really do not want to know the answer to. How long? I hear him answering in generalities, and then before I have the wisdom or the courage to withdraw the question, I hear him say, nobody knows for sure, but based on the pathology reports, I'd say five to 10 years. I leave his office. It's seven o'clock in the evening. The comfort of home in Columbus, Ohio is a 14-hour drive away. I decide to make the drive. Cell phones can be absolutely wonderful things. My wife is not sleeping, I'm driving, so we talk. I've been on this journey with her for 35 years. Tonight will be no exception. First, my thinking is really pretty primitive. My wife lovingly tries to elevate my thinking. Around two or three o'clock in the morning, I share a memory with her of when I was a boy, five or six years old, in my little bedroom in Scotia, New York. It's snowing outside. It's dark, it's winter. My mom comes in to say our prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I ask mom, what's this crap about dying? Of course, I didn't say it that way. I was five years old. <laughs> she tells me about it. Doesn't sound good. The neighbor's dog had died a few weeks earlier, and that didn't make them any too happy. My mom leaves the bedroom, and I am consumed with fear. Now, as I drive through the night, 53 years later, I realize I have no better concept or idea to how to deal with my inevitable death than I did when I was five or six years old. I arrive the next morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. I walk in through the front door. My wife, Phyllis, greets me at the door with a smile on her face and tears in her eyes, and I realize I am not alone. Chapter 3. Chapter three is called a blank calendar. I'm CEO of an organization, and I meet with the board several weeks after my diagnosis, and I resign. They asked me to stay on as chairman. This could be the best piece of advice I share with you this afternoon. If anybody ever, ever, ever asks you to be chairman, take it. From my experience, you do absolutely nothing, and yet it still sounds good at a cocktail party. <laughs> I take the job. 
I now have a blank calendar. Not for a day, not for a week, but for months and months and months. I think it's a blessing. It's an incredible curse. Within weeks, I'm deeply depressed. I don't mean the kind of depression where you feel a little blue. I can't eat, I can't sleep. I've gone from being CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation to the point where if the guy at the end of the grocery line asks me papers or plastic, I have no idea how I'll answer it, and the thought of it sends shivers down my spine. With medical help, I work my way out of the depression, but as I come out of the depression, I realize I am a person who needs a purpose. Escape is not the answer for me. I need something to occupy my time and something toward which to devote my humble talents. But toward what purpose? Chapter four. Chapter four is called 27 Students, 20 Letters, and a New Purpose. It's January 2006, and I'm standing in front of 27 students at DePaul University. I've just completed teaching a winter term course in happiness, or what leads to really meaningful, fulfilling, joyful, abundant living. I have 27 students. I have them four hours a day, four days a week for four weeks. They take one course during the month of January. As the 27 students pile out of the room, 20 of them hand me personal letters, some of them three or four pages long. Ten of them go make an appointment with the president and go see the president and say, every student at DePauw needs to take this course. Six months later, I'm at Canyon Ranch in Tucson, Arizona, probably the granddaddy of health and well-being spots. Now I'm speaking not to college students, I'm speaking to people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, 70s, very successful people. I don't change a single story, I don't change a single concept. The result is equally positive. Now I'm driving to the airport. I'm feeling really good. If I was a peacock, I'd have my feathers all spread out like this. One of the things I've really come to realize is I seek approval and look to get my ego stroked far more than I really should. I get to the airport, I upgrade to first class, I deserve it. I get on the airplane, there's nobody sitting next to me, and they can probably see the feathers. I spread out, <laughs> and just about the time the plane takes off, that's when I hear the voice. Doug, what? I guess you fooled them, huh? What do you mean I fooled them? They loved it. They loved it. They liked it okay. But you talked about 13 skills that lead to happiness, well-being, contentment, serenity, joy. How many of them do you practice? Oh, leave me alone. Practice what you preach, Doug. Did you ever hear that expression? Go away. Of course, we all know it doesn't go away, because we all know, as George Burns said, conscience is a mother-in-law whose visit never, never ends. <laughs> Guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. It badgers me all the way back through Dallas, where I changed planes, all the way back to Columbus. And when I arrive in Columbus, I've created a little card that I have the 13 skills on, like this, and I decide I'm going to put that on my mirror. And I'm going to practice each day one of the skills of the things that I've talked about in terms of the skills that lead to happiness. But more importantly, I realize I have a new purpose in life. And my purpose is to better, number one, better understand what leads to happiness, what leads to joyful, meaningful, fulfilling, abundant living. What are the skills that enable that? Number two, to practice those skills in my own life. And number three, to share my knowledge with as many people as I possibly can. Chapter five. What's chapter five? <laughs> It'll come to me in a minute. Uh, blank calendar, then chapter five is, I have a new purpose, and so chapter five. Oh, I really lost my train of thought here. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I will be back. Oh, yeah. What is happiness? Of course. Chapter five is, what is happiness? <laughs> so, what is happiness? Um, it's not what you think. We're not talking about something up here. We're not talking about mood. We're talking about something much more fundamental and foundational. What we're talking about is an underlying and predominant sense of well-being and contentment. It underlies somebody's life. It's like ballast in, the, in life. When I was a kid, I had a punching bag. I could punch it, but knock over it. It would always come back. I think genuinely people, happy people, are that way. They go through financial loss. They bounce back. Broken relationship. They bounce back. Loss of a job. Health issues. They bounce back. They keep coming back to a sense of underlying sense of well-being and contentment. They understand that grief and sorrow and anger are stages in life. They're not permanent places of residence. 
And I think what enables genuinely happy people to have that kind of ballast in their life is they have a perspective about three things. The first is how they remember the past. They remember the past with serenity. What's ever happened to them in the past, they've let it go, they've learned from it, and they've moved on. The second thing they've got is they've got confidence about the future. They don't know what the future holds, but they feel as if I'll plan for it, I'll prepare for it, but whatever comes my way, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out if it comes along. And if they can do those two things, they can have confidence about the future, and they can let go of the past and have serenity about the past, then they can live in the present where so much joy is to be found. But so many of us step out of the present and into the past with anger or remorse, or we step into the future with fear and trepidation. In sports, as we witnessed in the Ryder Cup, it's called choking. In life, it's called unhappiness. Ah, let me get a drink of water. So what I want to do in my closing minutes is I want to share with you uh, chapters six and seven of my best-selling, soon to be published, even sooner to be finished, book <laughs> on happiness. And those two chapters are going to deal with how we remember the skills about remembering the past and skills about anticipating the future with confidence. So chapter six is getting past the past. My wife, Phyllis, and I were married in Baltimore, Maryland in June of 1969. We started a long drive from Baltimore, Maryland to Minneapolis, where I had my first job as assistant product manager on Bisquick Baking Mix at General Mills. So we're driving in this distance, and she, when Phyllis gets in the car, she likes to stop and see things. I want to get there. She's always wanted to see Niagara Falls. We're going to be traveling about uh, 20 miles from Niagara Falls. She, I want to get there. I just want to get there when I get in the car. She falls asleep around Rochester. I don't wake her up. I don't want to disturb <laughs> She wakes up. She says, where are we? I say, we're about halfway between Erie and Cleveland. I'll save you the ensuing conversation. We just get short of Cleveland. I turn the car around and I drive back to Niagara Falls. Get to Niagara Falls. Get to... Wise choice, I know. We get to Niagara Falls and there is no, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, nobody's at Niagara Falls. The place is absolutely deserted. I still park at the far end of the parking lot with the car facing out so I can make a quick getaway. We walk down to Niagara Falls and what we see is a mud hole. There is no water coming over the American side of Niagara Falls. In June of 1969, they built a dike across, closed off the water, and diverted it all to the Canadian side. So we're looking at a mud hole. Phyllis makes a perfectly logical suggestion. Let's drive over to the Canadian side and see the Canadian side. I said, get in the car. We're going to Minneapolis. And we drove in silence from the Niagara mud hole to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, if you say the words Niagara Falls, to my wife today, 43 years later, she smiles. And in fact, she could smile about two weeks after it, and both of us could laugh about what a jerk I was, and I was a jerk. We could both laugh about it and tell stories and tell our friends about it. And I didn't realize it then, and oh, do I wish I'd realized it, but we were practicing the most important skill I'll share with you in terms of forgiveness today, which is the skill of forgiveness. And it is a skill. It's two separate skills. One is she was practicing the skill of forgiving somebody else, which is about being able to release the desire for vengeance. You can't have a better illustration that Frederick illustrated this morning with some, forgiving somebody who'd cut off his hands. You couldn't have a better illustration. It's releasing the desire for vengeance to hurt somebody else. I was practicing a separate skill. My skill had to do with self-esteem which is I'm worthy of being able to make a mistake, I'm worthy of learning from it, and worthy of being able to uh, move on. Two very separate skills. There's only, f the reason that forgiveness works is it gets crap out of your life. It gets all the hurts and the junk out of your life. There's only four things you can do with junk from your past. One is you can hold on to it, which is what most of us do. We hold on to it to either beat ourselves up unnecessarily or to get back at somebody else. The second thing you can do is you can forget about it. Great if it happens. Phyllis and I are not going to forget about Niagara Falls. The third thing you can do is you can repress it. It always comes back in unsavory ways. And the fourth thing you can do is you can forgive. It's a magic elixir in terms of happiness. It lets you get stuff out of your life that you don't want to carry around with you. If I had said, 
43 years later, if you ask Phyllis, if you say the words Niagara Falls, she turns red in the face, you would not have been surprised. And think of what that would do to our relationships, to our health, to our family, if you carry that kind of anger around over a simple thing uh, like that for 43 years. Finally, I want to share with you chapter seven. Chapter seven is finding confidence in the future. I think there's, it's, it's that people that are genuinely happy look at the future with excitement and confidence. And they do that in part because they got four skills that I call FOFO. Faith, optimism, flexibility, and openness. FOFO. Let me explain. We, we uh, discovered that uh, Phyllis was pregnant in late 1970. And despite the fact that she did everything that you could do to have a perfectly normal child, in the very early mornings of Saturday, July 10th, 1971, our oldest son, Gordon, was born through an emergency cesarean as a result of a doctor's misdiagnosis of placenta separata. Gordon wasn't ready to be born. Gordon's lungs weren't fully developed, and as he struggled to breathe and live during those first, first hours, it left him mentally challenged. Now, for years and years, I agonized about my son Gordon's future. Really, probably more about my own future than his, but I agonized about it. Will he, be able to go to, will he be able to go to school? Will he be able to walk? Will he be able to talk? When will he be able to walk and talk? Will he be able to go to normal school? Will he be able to hold down a job? Will he be able to live independently? I agonized about every aspect of Gordon's, Gordon's future. And sometime around when he was in his early teenage years, I gradually began to look at Gordon very differently. I began to look at Gordon and realize he was a beautiful son just the way he was. What he lacked in IQ, he more than made up in EQ. We've moved around a lot in this country. Every place we've moved, Gordy's the one they missed the most. He's a, he was a wonderful son, and I started to realize it. And what I needed when I faced Gordon's future was I needed FOFO, faith, optimism, flexibility, and openness, faith. I needed faith that Phyllis and I, with Gordon's help and God's help, would figure it out that we would be able to meet whatever the future brought our way. I've come to believe it's an incredibly, incredibly benevolent universe. It will always, always, always bring you what you need. Not necessarily what you want, it will bring you what you need. You do your part, it will do its part. The second thing I needed was optimism. We have the capacity to think both pessimistically and optimistically. Optimism and happiness correlate almost exactly one to one. I needed to spin positive stories about Gordy's future, not negative stories about Gordon's future. Eisenhower had it right when he said, I never met a pessimistic general who ever won a battle. I needed to think with optimism. And the third and the fourth thing I needed was flexibility and openness. Here's how most of us look at the future. I'm here. I want to go there. Here's the pathway forward. We see a pathway, one pathway forward. The truth is there's a million pathways that'll take me from here to there. And as we step into the future, we need to realize the universe is going to take us in all kinds of different directions. And as opposed to agonizing the fact that we're off our original plan, we need to figure out where we are, get back on it, and just and move forward again to where we want to go. And the other thing we need is openness. Because fr quite frankly, sometimes we may never get to where we originally envisioned. We may end up over there, or there, or there, and that may be just fine. We need openness to accept where we are. Helen Keller said it well. She said, when one door to happiness closes, another opens. But we are so fixated on the closed door, we fail to see the open door. If I was still fixated on the original vision I had for my son, Gordon, I would miss so much joy that he offers to me, to my wife, Phyllis, and to my other son, Greg. This is my uh, oldest son today, uh, Gordon. 41 years old, he's a, uh, he lives with us, and I think he looks a little bit like me, and uh, he, he's a, a bagger at, uh, at Kroger. Some of you may recognize him. And I think, by the way, corporations could learn a lot from Kroger in terms of how it utilizes the, hand, benefit, the skills of the handicapped for the benefits of its owners, its employees, and for its customers. Faith, optimism, flexibility, and openness. I want to end with this. I think it's hard to be happy. I think it's really hard to live joyfully, particularly when the world starts to move against you and things seem to be not turning out the way you want it. It's easy to be miserable. The reason it's hard to be happy is I think it's a skill. In fact, it's a set of skills. 
And like any set of skills, we can get better at the skills of happiness or what leads to abundant, joyful life, life through practice, through focus, and through attention. And I believe ideas about how to better practice the skills of happiness are ideas worth spreading. And that's why I stand before you this afternoon. Thank you for your attention.